Folks, we are living in a culture that is rapidly deteriorating. Okay? We are living in a culture where you name it, just about anything is prevalent and thriving. Any type of sin, any type of you know, uh, debauchery, any type of, of life to the excess, not only is it rampant and prevalent, but it is paraded in front of you all the time via media, via television, via the internet, via radio. You, you can hardly escape this, this type of bombardment that is, that is currently happening in the, in the culture that we are currently living in in the United States. And the fact is, those of you that are older than me and, and so forth, you know, like Lee, you can, you can remember back to a time when, you know, things were, were a lot different than they are now. And where there was still some semblance of, uh, of Christianity and, and, and biblical morality, if you will, in the country and so forth. And, and you look around right now and basically anybody over 30 years old is completely unchurched. Not throw aside the Word of God rightly divided for a minute. They don't know anything about the Bible. They don't know anything about God. They're completely unchurched, and they really don't know much of anything from a scriptural mindset. And as a result, we're seeing the fruit of that right now in the culture that we live in. And the Corinthian church, the Corinthian church is a church that is, that is in a similar situation. They're in a similar environment. They're in a situation, and we'll, we'll cover some of this material here this morning, but they're in a situation in an environment where there is where there's rampant sexual promiscuity, where there's all kinds of, of life to the excess and debauchery and all sorts of, in, in, in a culture that is just really pervaded with a lot of sin. And the Corinthians are expected to, to find their way, as a member of the church, the body of Christ, living in the middle of that environment, living in the middle of that situation. So one of the main reasons why I chose 1 Corinthians is because I look at the Corinthian epistles and I look at where we are right now in the life of the nation in our current culture, and I just really believe that there's things here in Paul's epistles to the, first, to, to the Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, that we need to get a hold of as an assembly. Okay? Now, I'm not going to be bashful about it. There are also some issues here in First Cor and Second Corinthians that are going to be controversial. Okay? There's issues here regarding even that sometimes grace believers don't agree on, like issues related to the Lord's Supper and... Uh, issues sometimes related to spiritual gifts and other things. Um, so not everything is going to be easy to do here. Not everything is going to be easy to cover. But I think where we are at not only as an assembly, number one, but also thinking about where we're at as an assembly and where we are at in our society at large, I think there's a lot of relevant, pertinent information that we can get from a, a detailed study of the Corinthian epistles. I just mentioned to you already uh, in the, before I read the Scripture reading that we have decided, the board fi officially has decided and ready to announce that the theme of the conference this coming uh, October is going to be titled, What in the World is Going On? Grace and Our Culture. A lot of things going on. Not only in the government, but also socially and, and in all different aspects of, of the government and our situation that we currently find ourselves in. So if you want to know why 1 Corinthians, those are some of the reasons why. Those are some of the reasons why I chose that. And as we start this introduction this morning, I hope to be able to bring out some more information regarding that choice. So this morning, what I want to do, and I'm, I'm going to be upfront about it, we're going to have a two-part introduction here to 1 Corinthians. We'll do the first part today, second part next week. And what I want to cover with you this morning is just some, some details about the city of Corinth itself about the environment that Paul himself was entering into when he goes into Corinth in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. Okay? And then also, secondly, I want to talk about, a little bit about and discuss the authorship and the date of when 1 Corinthians was written. Now, if you would, get two passages. You already have one of them. Get 1 Corinthians 1 in one hand and get Acts 18 in the other. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in one hand and Acts chapter 18 in the other. So we want to basically cover two points here this morning. We want to look at the city of Corinth and understand something about what that city was like when Paul was entering in there to begin preaching with the goal of establishing a local church in that area. And then secondly, we want to look at some things specifically about the authorship and the date for when 1 Corinthians was written. Then next week what we'll look at are some things about the, uh, the content of 1 Corinthians, where 1 Corinthians fits into... Um, in, into uh, Paul's epistles in terms of the canon of your Bible, 
And then also possibly some more details regarding what happens to Paul in Acts 18 when he shows up there. So to get started here, I want, I want you to read two things with me. First, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> he says here, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes our brother unto the church of God, which is where? At Corinth. To them that are sanctified in, Je in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So my first point that I want you to consider here is, does Paul address this letter to the saints that are in Corinth? Yes. There's a group of local, there's a local church, there's a local body of believers that Paul has previously established in the city of Corinth here when he's writing to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. All right? Now, go back to, to Acts 18 quick. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came where? To Corinth. Now, what I want you to think about, the, the first point, I want you to think about this this morning. When Paul leaves Athens and comes to Corinth, is there a church in Corinth? When he first sets foot in that city, is there a church there? Okay. Are there any believers there at all? We don't know. Maybe there were some from other areas. Maybe there were, maybe there weren't. The fact is we don't know for sure, right? But when he sets foot in that city, when he leaves Athens and he goes over to Corinth and he goes into that city, is there a local manifestation of the greater church, the body of Christ, located in the city of Corinth? The answer is what? No. So Paul basically is starting from ground zero here, okay? He is going to have to go in there and he's going to have to preach and get some people saved, number one, and then once he gets those people saved, he's going to have to edify them in sound doctrine, number two, then he's going to have to identify and enlist some faithful men that he can turn that assembly over to, so that when he leaves and goes to the next place, okay, they're going to be able to conduct themselves appropriately as a local church, as individual members of the church, the body of Christ, coming together to form a local church. But when you look at Acts 18, verse 1, <clears throat> After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, Italy, came, uh, came from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius, that's Emperor Claud that would be a reference to Emperor Claudius, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now look at verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and persuaded the Jews and who? The Greeks. So, without getting too far into the text here yet, until we get some more background information here, what I want you to understand, again, is that when he leaves Athens and he comes to Corinth, he is walking into a city that we would use in modern terminology, unchurched. Okay? There is no local church. There may be some individual believers there, but there is nothing uh, resembling a local manifestation of the greater body of Christ that has elders and that is functioning according to Paul's ministry pattern that he's setting up as he's going on his apostolic journeys here. Okay? So the city of Corinth. Let's talk a little bit about that. So he's setting foot in this city. What is, he in, what, what is in store for Paul? What is he going to have to deal with in this city of Corinth. The first thing is I want you to understand is that the ancient city of Corinth is located 40 miles west of Athens on a narrow isthmus between Peloponnesus and the mainland. Okay, so if you look up here on the map that I provided here for you, Corinth is here, Athens is here. It's, they're about 40 miles apart. There's an there's a isthmus right here, a small piece of land that is connecting what, it be, what is known as Achaia with the rest of Macedonia here, okay? So this is a strategic area both militarily, both in terms of trade and a lot of other things. So the location of the city is there on the isthmus between Peloponnesus and Achaia, and it, it connects the mainland there, okay? And it was a great commercial center of the Roman Empire. It had, in fact, three harbors, two of which were important. Um, and I'm going to butcher the names here, but uh, Lucuman, about one half mile to the west, and Centuria, about eight and one half miles to the east. So if you just look at the map, you should be able to see right here 
that the city of Corinth is centered right here. Okay? Now, why is that important? That is important, number one, in terms of trade and shipping in the old Roman Empire. This sea over here is the Aegean Sea. This connects any shipping that's heading to Rome is going to pass through here because it's quicker to go through here than it is to go all the way down around Achaia over to Rome. Okay? So that means that Corinth is strategically situated on a major shipping lane. So ships would come from either east or west, goods would be unloaded, transported across land, and brought to the next harbor. All right? So there's a lot of people going to be moving through Corinth. There's a lot of goods and material and trade. And Corinth is going to be sort of a real commercial hub and center of this part of the old Roman Empire, all right? Because of where it is situated and where it is located. Um, for a long time, historians could not find, well, I'll say it this way, the, the, the ruins of the ancient city of Corinth were lost for a, for a while. And it turns out that, an, that a, a fishing city, village, had been built across the top of them. But in 1928, there was a major earthquake in, uh, in Macedonia. And when that earthquake happened, the, the, it revealed the ruins of the ancient city of Corinth. And I got a few pictures of that, too. So, um, well, actually, I don't want let's, to... Let's look at this one first. This is zoomed in a little bit, but you can see here that ships would be coming and passing through here. If you were to go to the area today... There's now a canal that's actually been dug that connects, that connects one side of the isthmus with the other that allows ships to pass through without having to unload. Okay? But in the ancient world, they didn't have that, and they would literally come into port, unload, transfer the goods over to another port, and continue. And from everything I've read, that was still faster than going all the way down around the Aegean and up the other side over the Rome or other parts of, of Italy or other parts of the empire. So Corinth has a strategic location. And it is going to be a very busy city as a result of that. Some pictures that have been uh, uncovered after the excavation of the old city of Corinth. This is one of the main road systems that goods would have been transferred through the city from port to port. All right? And here's like the main square of the city where you would have uh, council meetings and, and, that, and that type of thing. But the bottom line is, this is a real city. There's archaeological evidence of its existence that, that is known to uh, archaeologists and historians today. A little bit about the details of the history of the city. During the Greek Empire, Corinth had been the head of the Achaean League. Well, you can understand why. I'm going to go back again to the map. You can understand why they're the head of the Achaean League because they're in the region of Achaia. Of Achaia all right? So the Greeks in their old system, this is an important city in the old Greek Empire before the Romans overthrew them. Later on, in 196 BC, Rome declared Corinth to be a free city, all right? which, meant you could, you, you, uh, which meant they were technically outside of the domain of the Roman Empire. It means a lot of different things. I don't want to get into all the details of what a free city meant, because uh, they're really not all that important for our purposes. But in 146 BC, Corinth rebelled. And the Romans came in and destroyed the city, basically leveled it to the ground under the general uh, Mummius. He comes in and destroys the city about uh, roughly about the year 146 B.C. And all of the treasures, all of the stuff were, were pillaged and taken back to Rome as a result of the Romans sacking the city. Which, by the way, the Romans are very good at, as you might know. Now, a hundred years later, about 46 B.C., so this would be roughly a hundred years before the time of Christ has, having his earthly ministry. Caesar, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city in all its former splendor and returned it to its former prominence. So Caesar, Julius Caesar rebuilds the city as a commercial shipping zone that will benefit the Roman Empire. So when Paul walks into the city, when, in Paul's day now, in the first century A.D., when he walks into the city, what kinds of things... It, what, what is he walking into, I guess? So understand first that, the, that Corinth was strategically located in the Roman province of Achaia between the Aegean and Adriatic Seas, All right, like you see there on the map. And again, not to belabor the point, but that is significant because of the traffic that is going to be moving through the city. Again, when Paul looks strategically at a map, no offense to anybody that lives in Marne, but does he put the church in Marne? No, he puts the church where? 
He puts it in Grand Rapids. Why does he put it in Grand Rapids? He puts it in Grand Rapids because it's the leading city of the region, right? Because all traffic and commerce and so forth is going to be coming and going out of that chief city. Corinth is the perfect place for such an assembly from a strategic viewpoint and vantage point because people are going to be passing through the city all the time. So the city's adjoining ports, as I already said, made it a center for sea route and trade from east to west and vice versa. Now, practically then, such positioning brought both the formation of a cosmopolitan city and culture that exemplified both extreme luxury and gross immorality. The Corinthian city, the city of Corinth, is a teeming city. It has a lot of money because of its trade value and, and where it's located. But there is also a lot of gross immorality within the city of Corinth. And we'll get into in a little bit of that here in a second. Uh, it is estimated that in Paul's day, Corinth was inhabited by about 400,000 people. That would be regular inhabitants of the city. Okay? That doesn't count sailors, sea traders, soldiers, anybody else passing back and forth as they travel across the, 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 the breadth of the, the Roman Empire. J. Vernon McGee in his commentary on, on 1 Corinthians uh, characterized Corinth as a perpetual vanity fair. The streets of the city were teeming with Greeks, Jews, Italians, sailors, merchants, adventurers, and refugees from all corners of the Roman Empire. And the reason again for that is because of where it is positioned. It was in Corinth that the vices of both East and West met in a demonstration of human degradation. They all, you, you, you want to talk about all manner of sin and debauchery and all manner of, you know, just sort of gross immorality, Corinth is the epicenter. Corinth is the place where things are coming and going across the, the, the middle portion of the Roman Empire, and they are all congregating there in that particular city. All right. So when Paul sets foot in that city for the first time in Acts chapter 18, you have some understanding of what he's walking into and what he's going to be dealing with. According to Arno C. Gabeline in his commentary on, on, this, uh, on 1 Corinthians, he says that, quote, so great was the moral corruption that the Greek word Corinthia, which means to live like a Corinthian, had become a byword of shame and villainous among the heathen of that time. So the word, the word Corinthian, to live like a Corinthian, actually became like a, a, a very commonly repeated slogan in the first century world. Because if you wanted to find sin and all that kind of thing, the Corinthian, you could go to Corinth and be sure to find it. All right, that's the point here. And to live like a Corinthian actually became a word in Greek that expressed what was going on with this, with the people and the inhabitants of this particular city. All right. Now, add to all that. So you've got you've got the commercial stuff, you've got the trade, you've got the people coming and going. What makes it worse is you also have built in Corinth the ancient temple to the goddess, Greek goddess Aphrodite. Okay? Aphrodite is, uh, Venus, I'm sorry, is the Roman equivalent of, of Aphrodite. But simply stated, if you want to know, the religion of the city of Corinth was characterized by sex. All right? At the temple of the goddess of Aphrodite was teeming with thousands of, quote, priestesses who were really, in actual fact, nothing more than temple prostitutes. And the way you worship the goddess, you know, the, the goddess Aphrodite was, was, you know, I don't think I need to explain it to you any more than that. I think you get the point, right? So you have, you have that, Paul has that to contend with. He has that to deal with. And those of you that know anything about the Corinthian epistle, and you know about the gross immorality that Paul writes to them about, you can understand one of the reasons why is they're living in a, in, a, in a city that has a culture where that's all there in front of them and it's paraded in front of them all the time, every day, as a result of where they're located. So you can understand how that is going to be a struggle. And oh, by the way, is that kind of stuff paraded for us all the time? I think you know the answer to that. Pastor Stam, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, he thinks that there are two important uh, two important religious realities of the city of Corinth that bear noting. Okay, So two things to keep in mind. Uh, number one, according to Pastor Sam, is the following. Quote, he says, 
so that we might sympathize with these often stumbling believers, understanding their background and situation in which they found themselves. So what, he, what, he's, what he's trying to point out there is, when you look at the kinds of things that Paul addresses in the, the epistle, it makes sense that he would be dressing, addressing those things to that particular church in that particular location because of the cultural environment that they were living in. They are living in an environment where this type of, where this type of you know, rampant sex and promiscuity is, 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 is everywhere as a result of the, where they're located. Okay? Second, his second reason why, Pastor Sam's second reason why it's important to note this is so that we might recognize what an amazing miracle of grace it was that there was even a Christian assembly in that city at all. Okay? I mean, you think about, you think about one, of, one of the places that you would want to like, get your wife and kids out of. It would be Corinth. Okay? It, would be, it would be the city of Corinth. I mean, you want to talk about urban sprawl and you know, leaving the city to go live in the suburbs and that kind of thing. Looking at what's going on here, this would be a place where you, where you would look at it and you would say, boy, I really, I really don't think it's good for me and my family to live in this particular area, in this city, because of everything that's going on here. Both, and, and see, what I'm trying to get you to understand here is all of this is all there all the time, and they're living in this, in this sort of cesspool of things. Okay? Another thing to consider about the city of Corinth is that it was a center of philosophy and culture. Next to Athens, Corinth was famous for its many philosophers who taught there. Gabeline reports that Greek civilization and all its branches flourished in Corinth, and he says, quote, the fine arts were cultivated athletic games as well as schools of philosophy and rhetoric flourished in this proud city. So Paul is going to have to be dealing with a mix of all sorts of things here. The temple religion of the goddess Aphrodite, the rampant Greek philosophy, all of the different things that are all in this, 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 this fishbowl that is the city of Corinth. These are all things that Paul is going to have to contend with here as he begins to think about establishing a local church in this particular area. Now, before we move on to the second part of the message, go with, you're, in Acts chapter, you're in Acts 18, look at verse 1. It says, And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came where? To Corinth. Now, drop down with me. We'll get the intermittent verses probably next week, the majority of them. But for the sake of time this morning and for our purposes, go to verse 11. And it says, And he continued there, that's in Corinth, a year and what? Six months, teaching the Word of God among them. So Paul stays in this city teaching the Word of God for a year and a half or 18 months. Paul is there. So he comes in, there's nothing. He stays there for a year and a half, and after that year and a half he perceives that it's time for him to leave and to move on and to go other places. Okay? But he's, my point to you is that is he there for quite a bit of time? Yes. And I think you can understand why. Does he have a lot on his plate? Does he have a lot to deal with as he looks at what's going on in this particular city? Now, moving on now to the second point that I want to cover with you, and I did forget to animate these. So, come with me to first, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth. So the point is here, by the time he writes this epistle, has he already established a church? Yeah. He walks in, in Acts 18.1, there's nothing there. He stays there for 18 months, he walks out, and now he's writing them after the fact, after he's been there for 18 months, he's writing them this epistle where he's going to deal with some of the issues there that are facing the church. Now, there is no reason to believe that Paul didn't write the epistle. Look at verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Does Paul claim to be the author of the book? Yep, so we're not even going to talk about that anymore. Paul's the author, okay? Now, there is something, though, to consider here. Is this the first letter that Paul wrote the Corinthians? Come with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5.
In the, chap, in the context here, in verse 1 it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, so, uh, and such fornication as is not named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Mm. We'll talk more about that what it means later on. But drop down now to verse... Um, he tells them in verse 5, "...to deliver such a one to Satan to the destruction of his flesh, uh, that, the spirit, that the Spirit might be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. Ye know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump." So there's this gross immorality going on in Corinth, according to chapter 5, verse 1, of such that isn't even named among who? The Gentiles... And are the, are, the Corinthians, are the Corinthians handling it properly? Or are they glorying in what's going on here? They're glorying in it, and he rebukes it, he's rebuking them for it here in chapter 5. Now look at verse, uh, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, and ye are unleavened, for even, even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Look at verse 9. I wrote unto you, in what? In an epistle, not to company with what? Fornicators. So, had Paul already previously wrote them something addressing the issue of the immorality that was going on in their midst? Okay, So you need to understand that 1 Corinthians is not the first time that Paul has written this group to address them on a particular issue. Now, do we have that epistle in our canon of Scripture? No, we don't. So does that mean our canon of Scripture is incomplete? Or does it mean that Paul wrote all kinds of letters to all kinds of people that were not necessarily inspired? Okay. First Corinthians is in the Bible because the God the Holy Spirit working in the midst of the saints in the first century New Testament prophet identified it as what? Scripture. The reason this other previous letter isn't in your Bible is because it wasn't what? Scripture. Okay? But what I want you to see is, is Paul corresponding with them before he writes them this big epistle? All right. Now, the impetus. What is the impetus for writing the book? The impetus, in my opinion, is twofold. All right? Number one, you have issues where Paul was informed, should say by visitors to Ephesus, of the division and immorality in Corinth. Okay? And second, the Corinthians had written to Paul a letter with some specific questions that they wanted him to answer. So let's look at that first category first. Look at, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Does Paul find out that there's division in the Corinthian church? Yeah. So one of the reasons he's writing them is to address this division, to address this contention. And how does he know about it? He what? He hears about it. Come to chapter 5, look at verse 1. We already, we already looked at it, but look at the, the first phrase in the verse. Chapter 5, verse 1, It is commonly reported there is fornication among you. Look, it's commonly reported. And you've got to understand, Paul's in Ephesus when he, when, he, when he writes this epistle. And he hears all the way in Ephesus about the gross immorality in the Corinthian church. And that, that is what, the first issue that spurs him to write them the epistle that we have in front of us. Go to chapter 11, look at verse 18. Go to chapter 11, look at verse 18. Chapter 11, verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly what? Believe it. So again, Paul's addressing issues that he's heard about that are transpiring there in the Corinthian church. Look at chap go to chapter 15, look at verse 12. Verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that He raised from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? So again, the first impetus for writing 1 Corinthians, as you have it in your Bible, is Paul is hearing reports 
about the divisions and the immorality that are taking place in the Corinthian church. Now, think about this from Paul's point of view for a minute. Did Paul go there and spend 18 months dealing with these folks? Okay? So you can understand that he's probably going to be somewhat frustrated or at least minimum brokenhearted over hearing about these things and so forth. Now, there's a second impetus for the writing of 1 Corinthians. Go to chapter 7, look at verse 1. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto who? See, what he does here in chapter 7 is he begins to address some things that they wrote him about. So they had questions, they had concerns, they had things they wanted answered, and so they write to Paul. So there's two things going on here. Paul is addressing, number one, things he's heard through reports, of their divisions and immorality. And second, he is writing them to answer their what? Their questions. Now, dates for the authorship of 1 Corinthians in study Bibles and commentaries, they obviously they, they don't agree. Schofield's, ref, Schofield's notes in my Schofield Reference Bible say 59 A.D., Nelson's complete book of Bible maps and charts says 56 or 57 A.D., as far as a year of when 1 Corinthians was written. Um, you know what? I think we just look at and try to figure out from the Scriptures when we think it was written. Come with me to Acts 19. Come over to Acts chapter 19. Now, we've already looked at some very basic things in chapter 18. We know he went to Corinth. We know he left Athens and went to Corinth. We know he was there for 18 months, a year and a half. He leaves. You're going to look at Acts chapter 19. Look at verse 21. By the way, just to, make, just to confirm that he goes to Ephesus, look at 19, Acts 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came where? to Ephesus and, finding certain, and finding, finding certain disciples. So Paul is in Ephesus, drop down to verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit that he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem. After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he, went in, so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed where? In Asia. So Paul sends Timothy and he sends Erastus and he sends them to go forth there into Macedonia while he stays in Ephesus, which is where? In Asia. Now this is all, this is all important. I personally believe that Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians somewhere there in verses 21 and 22 of Acts chapter 18. And I'm going to try to show you why I think that is the most accurate place to, to put the writing of the book of 1 Corinthians. All right. Now, I already mentioned, go to Acts 19.1 quickly. And it came to pass that while Apollos was where? At Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So while Paul is in Ephesus, who's in Corinth? Apollos, right? Come with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Come with me back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, by my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there is contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of who? Okay, what does that tell you right there? That tells you right there that 1 Corinthians had to have been written at least after Acts, after Acts 19.1. Because in Acts 19.1 we find out that who's in Corinth? Apollos. And where's Paul? He'll be over here. Actually, wait. From your point of view, Corinth would be here. Ephesus would be over here. Okay? So 
So, Apollos is where? In Acts 19.1. Corinth. Paul's where? In Ephesus. But now when he writes to them in 1 Corinthians, look again, look at what it says. Look at verse 12. Now, now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Now, that tells you then, that between the time Paul left, and the time he writes the epistle, who has had a ministry in, in Corinth? Apollos. Okay? And Apollos' ministry was such in Corinth, that there was an entire group within the Corinthian church that was identifying themselves with who? With Apollos. Okay? So verse 12, you got, you got four groups in the Corinthian church by the time Paul writes this. You've got the Pauline group, you've got the Apollos group, you've got the Peter group, and you've got the Christ group, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Okay? But what I'm trying to show you is, then that means that 1 Corinthians has to be written after Acts 19.1, because Acts 19.1 tells you that who's ministering in Corinth? Apollos. And Apollos in his ministry in Corinth teaches to such a degree and with such eloquence that he separates out from among that group a group of people in the local assembly that prefer Apollos' teaching over whose? Paul's. And he's addressing that issue now when he writes them the epistle. Okay, hopefully you're following that. Come with me back if you would to Acts 19. Come with me back to Acts 19. Look again at verse 22. It says here, So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed where? Okay, so who did he send? So Corinth is here, and I know some of you are like, what are you doing? Pointing to the air. Okay, but I have a mental map in my mind right now of the Mediterranean. Okay, and I see Corinth here, and I see Ephesus over here. So you're just going to have to deal with that. Okay. Here's Corinth, here's Ephesus. Ephesus, we've already seen that Corinth, well, I'll go back to the map, and then I'll lose my place in the, in the slide. But we've already seen that Corinth is just below Macedonia, right? Who does he send to Macedonia according to Acts chapter, 9, chapter 18, verse 22? Timotheus and who? Erastus, all right? Come with me back if you would. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Look at verse um, 16. Wherefore I beseech ye, be, be ye followers of me. Now look at verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you who? Timotheus. Have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, who did he send out in Acts, 18, 20, in Acts 19, 22? Timotheus and Erastus. Where did he send them? He sent them to Macedonia. Is Macedonia in the general region of where Corinth was located? Yes. And now we have in 1 Corinthians that who did Paul send unto the Corinthians? Look at verse 17. For this cause I have sent unto you who? Timotheus. Folks, it makes perfect sense to me that Paul writes the epistle of 1 Corinthians in Acts chapter 19, verses 21 and 22, entrusts it to Timothy, sends Timothy from Ephesus back to Macedonia, and one of Timothy's jobs is to deliver the epistle to who? The Corinthians. So it's reasonable, as I just said, to assume that when Paul sent Timothy into Macedonia, he carried 1 Corinthians with him. Come over to 1 Corinthians 16. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And this is important because it proves that all this whole time, Paul is still where? At Ephesus. 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse 8. But I will tarry where? At Ephesus until when? So is he still in Ephesus when he writes 1 Corinthians? Shake your head yes. Because that's what he said. 
right? He's still, he is still there. He is still in Ephesus when he writes 1 Corinthians. So that means if he arrives in Ephesus in Acts 19, and he's still there when he writes the epistle, and he sends, and he sends Timotheus with Erastus into Macedonia, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that, that he sent Timothy unto the Corinthians, well, folks, the case is building that he writes 1 Corinthians within the chronology of Acts chapter what? 19. Come with me to Acts chapter 20. Come over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, look at verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, that's the uproar that takes place there in Acts chapter 19 because of the uh, selling the, 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 the silver shrines to the great goddess Diana of Ephesus stops because of Paul's preaching and so forth. And in chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go where? So here's where you have to think about your Bible. Okay? Does he say in 1 Corinthians 16 that he's going to that he's at the end of the epistle, that he's going to stay in Ephesus until Passover. Yes. That means he's where when he writes it? He's in Ephesus. He doesn't leave Ephesus until Acts chapter 20, verse what? Don't worry about that, okay? Unless you... Acts chapter 20, verse 1, And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him his disciples and embraced them and departed for to go where? So, if, he, if, he, if he's going to stay in Ephesus till Passover, and he writes 1 Corinthians, and he doesn't leave Ephesus till Acts chapter 20, verse 1, but he was going to stay there till Passover, then you know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that 1 Corinthians was written sometime during the chronology of Acts chapter 19. And it makes the most sense then that you narrow that down then further, and you can say that he probably writes it around verses 21 or 22, prior to sending Timothy into Macedonia. Because then we see Timothy in 1 Corinthians referred to as having been sent to them by who? By Paul. So, this means then that 1 Corinthians was drafted and sent to the Corinthians during Paul's time in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. And it makes the most sense to view this as having been done around Acts 19 verses 21 and 22. Folks, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I, I personally find a way more value in being able to pinpoint where Paul wrote stuff in the Acts chronology than I do in being able to ascribe the exact year. I find, let me say that again in case you missed what I just said. I find way more value in being able to pinpoint in the Acts chronology where Paul wrote his epistles than I do being able to say, mm, 59. Oh, no, wait, 56. No, 50. You know, 57 is between 56 and 59, so we'll just say 57. I'm being sarcastic, but you understand what I'm saying. There's more value. So now I can understand what is going on for Paul, what is going on for the Corinthians, what is going on for both parties. Now, look, it, Paul's writing it from Ephesus. Is he having the gay old time in Ephesus? Or is he having trouble there too? So everywhere Paul goes, and all, in all these different contexts of controversy and trouble, God the Holy Spirit is giving him, insp by inspiration, causing him to write the Scripture, causing him to pen his epistles, okay? And one of them is 1 Corinthians. Now we've already seen. Was there a previous letter that is not in your Bible? Yeah. Now you're just going to have to trust God about that, folks. Okay, And you're going to have to trust God, come with me to Colossians chapter 1, you're going to have to trust God that if there was some other bit of information that you needed to know to be a mature, fully functioning member of the church, the body of Christ, that God the Holy Spirit would have made sure that that made its way into what? Into the canon, into the Scripture. Okay, Paul's very clear about this, and he's very clear that, his, that the revelation of the mystery committed to him completed and fulfilled the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 24. 
who now rejoice in my suffering for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister. Is Paul made a minister of something? What's he made a minister of in verse 25? According to. According to what, Paul? According to the dispensation of God, which is given to who? To me, he says. Did, did Paul have a dispensation of God committed to his trust? Okay, now read that whole sentence. It was given to me, what's the next two words? For who? For you. So why did God give it to Paul? So Paul would be able to walk around and say, oh, I have this great knowledge and information. Woo. Or so that Paul could tell who? Tell us. Look what it says. Or if I am a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given unto me for you to fulfill what? The Word of God. Folks, you either believe you have completed Scripture or you don't. That's, that's the only choices that you have. You either believe that you have all the information in your Bible that, that you need to have to be an established, secure member of the church, the body of Christ. You either believe that God was able... Look, if God is able to inspire His Word in the first place, is He certainly able to identify what books He wrote and make sure they're all collected into one place at one time? Come on now. Right? So don't be all upset because you, know, you don't have whatever that letter was that he wrote to the Corinthians. If you needed to have it, you would what? You would have it. When it says there, to fulfill the Word of God, what Paul is saying is that the revelation committed to him is the thing that brings the Word of God to its what? To its completeness. You're in, cha you're in Colossians, go to chapter 2. Look at verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10, and ye are complete where? What does it mean there when it says you're complete in Him? That means you're lacking nothing. That means you're complete. That means you're filled to capacity with everything you need as a member of the church, the body of Christ. You are complete in Christ. You are complete in the Beloved One. You are complete in the One with whom the Lord said, and God said, I am well what? Please. You're complete in Him. You see that word complete? That's the same word translated fulfilled. In chapter 1, verse 25. What does it mean that the dispensation of God was committed to Paul, to me, he says, for you, to fulfill the Word of God. Without this information, without this heretofore secret information, without God having revealed it to and through the Apostle Paul, you would not have a complete Bible. It is through the mechanism of the revelation of the mystery that the Word of God is made what? complete. You don't need to worry about not having that first letter. Come back with me to, first, to Acts chapter 18. We'll look at a few of these things in more detail, but I just want to close with a few observations from Acts 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After the, these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, born in Pontus, excuse me, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for by their occupation they were tent makers. When Paul goes into Corinth, does he go into the, to a city of great wealth? Are the Corinthians arguably the most financially and fiscally well off of any of the assemblies Paul establishes? Okay. And even when he goes in there, he does not seek to take advantage of their financial and fiscal prosperity and chooses instead to labor with his own what? Hands. Is 
Paul an apostle? Could he have exercised the right of an apostle and demanded that they support him? He's going to talk about that in 1 Corinthians. Yeah. Verse 4. And they reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So he's teaching the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were, were, and were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in his spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was who? Christ. What is he teaching them there? Folks, is he walking into a pagan city? Yeah. As he walks into that pagan city, does he have, does he have to start with them somewhere? Where does he start with them? Hold your hand there and go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he promised to four by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Wait a minute, I thought what Paul preached was a mystery. Yeah? But did Paul preach other things that were according to the Scriptures? Yeah. Not everything Paul says is all new material. Sometimes does he reach back into the Old Testament to illustrate this new material. Now he says here, which he had promised before and is holy promised by the Scriptures, concerning his Son who? So the Gospel of God is something pertaining to God's Son who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with what? With power. According to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What is the Gospel of God? The Gospel of God says and testified that the Lord Je that Jesus Christ was who? Was God. Was the Son of God. Was God incarnate in human flesh. And how do you know He was God incarnate in human flesh? Because God Almighty did what? Raised him from the dead. So if he's going to go into Corinth and he's going to go in there where they've never heard anything, most of them, he's got to start somewhere, and the place he's going to start is with talking to them about who Christ was. Do you got to got that's bad grammar? Do you need to know who Christ was before you can believe that he died on the cross for your sins and rose again and be justified and have the free gift of eternal life? So he starts at a basic ground zero level by showing them, go back to Acts 18, verse 5. So when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in his spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was who? What does he preach to them? He starts his preaching to them by teaching them the gospel of what? Of God. And opening up, he's dealing with Jews, right? Right? So he opens up the Jewish Scripture and he alleges to them out of their Scripture and proves to them that the Lord Jesus Christ was who? Was God. Now, to a lot of them, are they all like, oh, oh, thank you, Paul. We're so glad that you have cleared up this confusion for us. We really appreciate that. Read the next verse. And when they opposed themselves, and blasphemed. He shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto who? The Gentiles. See, when he goes in there, he has to start with the basics. The basics are that Jesus was who? Was God. If, if Jesus... What if I were in the precarious position that I believed that Jesus died and rose again, but I did not believe He was God. Would, that, would it do me any good to believe that He died and rose again without believing that He was who He said He was? That would do me what? That would do me no good. So as He goes in and He's got this blank slate, this canvas, the first thing He, he teaches them is that Jesus Christ was what? 
Most of them say what? In verse 5, they oppose themselves. In verse 6, excuse me, they oppose themselves in blaspheme. They shook their raiment. They didn't want it. Verse 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice. One that, one that, I love this. One that worshiped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. You know what that means? That's like a duplex. Paul's holding church meeting in the next door residence with a wall that's joined hard to the synagogue. Can you imagine what that would have been like? That in and of itself is just a fascinating concept to think about. Okay? So here are some very basic things about 1 Corinthians, about the city of Corinth, what Paul's dealing with, what the cultural environment is, what the setting is, what the, the religious and philosophical mindset and bent of the people was, and gives you some, some insights into what Paul is dealing with when he is dealing with the Corinthians and seeking to establish a local church. Okay? Number two, Paul writes 1 Corinthians at some point during Acts 19. My personal opinion is that it is somewhere in verses 21 or 22 before he sends Timotheus and Erastus back to Macedonia. Okay? And third, when he goes in and he starts with them from nothing, the first thing he does is he teaches to them the gospel of God. See, what, to me, as I think about the gospel of God, the gospel of God is sort of Paul laying down, throwing down the cards and saying, where are you at with respect to that? If you're with me there, then come on, we'll go over here and I'll teach you some what? Some more stuff. If you don't agree with me about this, there's no point in you what? going on, because if you can't get that, and if you refuse that, and you don't want to believe that Jesus was the Son of God, declared to be such by resurrection of the dead, then anything else we're going to go, anything else we're going to go over from here on is not going to be of any value or benefit to you if you don't believe that. Because what he's going to say next is that, oh, by the way, that one, that's the Son of God, he died for you on the cross, paid the price for your sins, shed his blood, and rose again so that you could be what? Justified. If you don't get the first thing, you're, and if, I shouldn't say it that way, if you willfully reject the first, you're not going to get the second. And so by going in there, he, he lays all the cards on the table and he says, here's what I've got to say. Those that agreed with him and believed, he brings over here to the house of justice and starts teaching them some, some further things. The rest of them stay where they were. They're mad about it, but they... They don't, they, don't, they don't become a part of this local assembly Paul's establishing. So all that being said, that's part one of our introduction to, the, to, to 1 Corinthians. And so next week what we're going to do is I'm going to try to show you the place of 1 Corinthians in the canon, why that's significant. Uh, say a few more things here about Acts 18, about some introduction things about the church in Corinth and what happened to Paul there. And then after that we'll be, we'll be digging into the meat and the details of 1 Corinthians and start, start working our way through the rest of the text there. So I appreciate your time and attention and uh, for having come out and been a part of the study. And I trust that this will be a, a good study for us. Folks, this will be a very pertinent study, I, I firmly believe, for where we are right now in 2015. It's been, it's been uh, almost 2,000 years since this stuff happened that we're reading about, but it's just as real today if it, as it was then. The only Father, we thank you once again for your word and for these saints that have gathered here this morning to hear your word preached. We're grateful for having saved us and, and sealed us and made us, made us members of the church, the body of Christ. We pray as we look at 1 Corinthians, and we, this morning as we try to understand just sort of the setting and what's going on and when the book was written and so forth, that we'll have clarity from your word on these things and that they would become practical realities in the details of our life. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.